In this video, we're going to present an example that illustrates the predictions of the von Mises isotropic hardening plasticity model under different loading conditions. For simplicity, we are assuming that the material follows a bilinear relationship with true stresses of 400 and 550 MPa corresponding to a total strain of 0 0.002 and 0 0.25. Young's Mollias and Poisson's ratio are given in the example. There are three loading conditions for which we need to calculate the elastic and plastic strain components, which are, in the first loading condition, a specimen is under ANA axial state of stress, and the stress increases up to 550 MPa. In the second loading condition, a specimen is in a biaxial state of stress. Sigma on 1 increases to 550 MPa, while sigma 2 2 is such that epsilon 2 2, the total strain, is kept at zero. In the third loading condition, a specimen is loaded in a triaxial state of stress. Sigma on 1 increases to 550 MPa, while epsilon 2 2 is kept at zero. In a plane strain condition, implying epsilon 3 3 is also equal to zero, implying that there is a stress sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 that keep both epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 equal to zero. The first step is to understand how to extract the material properties from the given parameters. The value of the stress at 0 0.002 is equal to 400. The ratio between 400 and 0 0.002 gives the Young's modulus, so we can assume that 400 is the elastic limit. The true stress strain curve is now shown with a bilinear, uh, um, as a bilinear curve. From the given stress strain curve, we now need to extract the curve relating the yield stress to the equivalent plastic strain. At 400, the equivalent plastic strain is equal to zero. So we start the curve at 400. At 550, the equivalent plastic strain is equal to the total strain, which is given as 0.525 minus the elastic strain. And the elastic strain is equal to the value of the stress divided by Young's modulus. So the plastic strain is equal to the total strain minus the elastic strain, which is 550 divided by Young's modulus we end up with a value of 0 0.24725. This curve can then mathematically be described as follows. Sigma yield is equal to 400 plus the slope, which is 150 divided by 0 0.24725, 150 being the difference between 550 and 400, and this value is equal to this value, so this is the slope, multiplied by the equivalent plastic strain. The slope is equal to 606.673. So sigma yield is equal to 400 multiplied plus the slope h multiplied by the equivalent plastic strain. The first condition is straightforward. At sigma equal 550, we know that the elastic strains uh, can be obtained by the plasticity uh, by the by the, the elastic constitutive law. We know that sigma 2 2 is equal to 0 and sigma 3 3 is equal to 0, so the elastic strain epsilon 1 is equal to 550 divided by E. The other two elastic strain components are equal to minus Poisson's ratio multiplied by um, epsilon elastic 1 1. The, equivalent, uh, the, the, the plastic strain component 1 1 is given by 0 0.24725. The other two components are equal to negative half multiplied by uh, Epsilon um, plastic 1 1. While in the uniaxial state of stress it was straightforward as shown in the previous slide, however, we are going to follow through the procedure for a general three dimensional state of stress. First, we have to characterize th uh, the, the, the different values for the uh, current state of stress. The hydrostatic, the, the stress matrix in this condition is given by sigma on one and then the rest are equal to zeros. 
the, the hydrostatic stress is equal to the average of the diagonal component, so sigma on 1 over 3. The von Mises stress is actually equal to sigma on 1. When we substitute the stress into the equation, we find that the sigma von Mises is equal to sigma on 1. The deviatoric stress tensor is equal to sigma minus uh, the hydrostatic stress multiplied by the identity matrix. We get those components for S. The elastic strain components can be obtained directly using the elasticity constitutive law. Epsilon elastic 1, 1 is equal to sigma 1, 1 over E, and the other two are equal to negative Poisson's ratio sigma 1, 1 over E, and the other, the shear strains are all equal to zero. This is the condition in the elastic regime when sigma 1 Mises, which is equal to sigma 1, 1 is less than the yield stress or the initial yield stress which is equal to 400. So before that, the plastic strains are equal to zero. So what happens beyond the yield? Once the stress reaches a value higher than 400, and as it increases to above 500, we need to follow the material curve, showing the relationship between the yield stress and the equivalent plastic strain, we need to use it to find the, uh, the plastic strain components in the material. So we often start with the consistency condition. Delta phi or delta f is equal to zero. Delta phi or delta f is equal to partial sigma von Mises divided by partial sigma ig multiplied by delta sigma ig where summation happens over ig minus delta sigma yield, which is the slope multiplied by delta equivalent plastic strain. The only stress component that varies is sigma on one. So we only have three over two S11 divided by sigma of one Mises, which is partial sigma one Mises by partial sigma IJ. You will have to remember um, this expression multiplied by delta sigma on one. That's the only stress that's changing minus the slope multiplied by delta epsilon plastic. S11 and sigma of 1 Mises, we have a value for S11, we have a value for sigma of 1 Mises. This term is equal to 1, so we end up with saying uh, with the equation that 0 is equal to sig delta sigma on 1 minus h multiplied by the equivalent plastic strain. We know delta sigma on 1, we can calculate the e equivalent plastic, delta equivalent plastic strain. Therefore, the equivalent plastic strain is equal to delta sigma on 1 divided by h. We can then calculate the total equivalent plastic strain either by a numerical integration or analytical integration when sigma 1, 1 goes from 400 all the way to 550. The components of the equivalent plastic strain can now, the component of, or the equivalent plastic strain can then be input here so that we, using the associated flow rule, we can then calculate the components of the plastic strain using the, the, the equation that the delta epsilon uh, plastic ij is equal to the equivalent plastic strain, the incremental equi equivalent plastic strain multiplied by partial sigma von Mises or partial phi with respect to sigma ij, which is always equal to 3 over 2 SIG multiplied divided by sigma von Mises. By substitution uh, of the corresponding values of the components of S, and noticing that sigma von Mises is equal to sigma on 1, we obtain the relationship that we already know that delta epsilon plastic 1 1 is equal to delta epsilon, uh, the equivalent plastic strain. The other two components are equal to negative half multiplied by the equivalent plastic strain, and all the shear uh, plastic strains are equal to zero. The total values of these strains can be obtained using uh, analytical or numerical integration. The total strains, epsilon 1, is equal to the sum of elastic and the plastic, 
Elastic component is always equal to sigma 1 over E and the plastic component is obtained from the previous uh, slides. Same with epsilon 2, 2 and epsilon 3, 3. And all the shear strains are equal to zero. And here we show the relationship between epsilon 1, 1 and sigma 1, 1. When sigma 1, 1 is less than 400, we have the elastic behavior. Once sigma 1, 1 increases above 400, we have elastoplastic behavior, where the total strain is divided into an elastic component and the plastic component. Let's look at the second loading condition. In the second loading condition, we have two non-zero stress components, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2. Sigma 1, 1 increases from uh, 0 to 550. Sigma 2, 2 is such that epsilon 2, 2 is equal to 0. The deviatoric stress tensor is equal to sigma minus the hydrostatic stress multiplied by the identity matrix and gives me those, uh, those values for uh, the deviatoric stress tensor. In this case, loading is divided into two stages, an elastic stage and a stage accompanied by plastic deformation. The point of separation between the two cases is when the von Mises stress reaches 400, the initial yield. Here is the equation for the von Mises stress. We are going to set this to be equal to 400. This provides a relationship between sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2. Now we know that sigma 1, 1 can take any value between 0 and 550, but we don't know what to do with sigma 2, 2. So we use the condition that epsilon 2, 2 is kept at 0. In the elastic regime, we know that the epsilon 2, 2 elastic is equal to 0. But epsilon 2, 2 elastic in the elastic regime is equal to sigma 2, 2 over E minus plus 1 ratio sigma 1, 1 over E, which gives us a relationship between sigma 2, 2 and sigma 1, 1. So when we can take this relationship and substitute it in the von Mises stress equation, we can find a value for sigma 1, 1 at the onset of yielding. So the material starts yielding when sigma von Mises reaches 400, which is when sigma 1, 1 reaches 450 and sigma 2, 2 reaches around 135 MPA. In the elastic regime, we can use the elasticity constants to find the components of the elastic strain. In the plasticity regime, when sigma von Mises starts increasing be beyond 400, the first step is to use the consistency condition to find an expression for the incremental change of the equivalent plastic strain. Here's the consistency condition, and we have two stress components that vary, sigma on one and sigma two two. So in the rate form, this is partial sigma von Mises by partial sigma on one, partial von Mises by partial sigma two two. This is the rate of sigma on one, the rate of sigma two two, minus the slope multiplied by the rate of the equivalent plastic strain. This equation should be used to find the equivalent plastic strain. We can decide on sigma 1, 1 because the stress is increasing, but we don't know what to do with the slope of sigma 2, 2 or the rate of sigma 2, 2. Rearranging gives us this relationship. Again, we need to find this as a function of sigma uh, dot 1, 1, but we don't know what to do with sigma dot 2, 2. So we need another equation. And the other equation is obtained from the second condition that says epsilon to 2 is kept 0 in a plane stress condition. So epsilon to 2 total is equal to 0, which means the rate of the change of strain, which is equal to the elastic strain component plus the increment plus the plastic strain increment or the elastic strain rate plus the plastic strain rate, these are both equal to 0. This is equal to the elastic component. Uh, so epsilon elastic is related to sigma dot 2, 2 and sigma dot 1, 1 with the elastic constants. Epsilon 2, 2 dot using the, the plastic component using the, uh, the flow rule is equal to partial uh, phi by partial sigma 2, 2 multiplied by epsilon prime, uh, the, multiplied by the rate of the equivalent plastic strain. So these two equations can then 
be used to write everything in terms of sigma uh, dot one one. All right, so we ended up with th these two equations can be arranged to write sigma to two a dot as a function of sigma one one dot and the rate of the equivalent plastic strain is also a function of the rate of sigma on one. These rate equations can be integrated numerically using explicit or implicit Euler method by assuming some uh, value for delta sigma on one and, and using the values at the beginning or end of the increment for the slopes and then uh, 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 Calculating um, uh, ca uh, calculating the increments in these and adding them numerically. Here we show the results of the numerical integration. The first graph shows the relationship between sigma two two and sigma one one. In the elastic regime, sigma two two is equal to Poisson's ratio multiplied by sigma one one. When the plasticity kicks in, once sigma on one reaches around 450 and sigma to two reaches around 130, there is a sudden increase in sigma to two, followed by a different rate of change for sigma to two for versus sigma on one. The existence of the two different slopes in the plastic regime is due to the different rates of change in the elastic uh, and plastic regimes. And these two rates, uh, the student should try to explain this change in the rate by carefully examining the equations relating the rates of stress of sigma 2, 2 and sigma 1, 1. The second, the second graph shows epsilon plastic 1, 1 versus sigma 1, 1. The plastic strains are zero until plasticity kicks in and starts increasing beyond that point. Similarly for epsilon 3, 3 and epsilon 2, 2. But note that the plastic strain to 2 and plastic strain 3 to 3 have negative values implying compressive permanent deformation. The material will permanently shrink in the directions to 2 and 3 3. The second curve here shows the relationship between the elastic strain to 2 and the applied stress sigma on 1. Before plasticity kicks in, the condition that epsilon to 2 is equal to 0 leads to the stresses are all equal to 0. Once, uh, once the plasticity kicks in, and because the total strains are equal to 0, we can see a tensile stress in the direction 2, 2. This tensile stress is to compensate for the permanent plastic compressive strain. Sorry, a tensile strain, a positive tensile strain. This positive tensile strain is to compensate for the permanent plastic compressive strain since uh, the loading condition is such that the total strain, which is the sum of both the elastic and plastic components, is equal to zero. The curves sh here show how the total strains 1, 1 and 3, 3 change with the applied loading with a behavior characteristic of the given bilinear stress strain curve. In the last loading regime, a scenario, sigma on one is increased, again, to 550, while epsilon to two and epsilon to three are both set to zero. This happens by providing a stress sigma to two and sigma three three that ensure epsilon to two and epsilon three three total strains are equal to zero. The deviatoric stress tensor is given, uh, the components are given here. In the elastic regime, the relationship between the stresses and the strains are given here. The total strain epsilon to, or the elastic strain to two is equal to zero. The elastic strain three three is equal to zero, and this gives us a relationship between sigma two two, sigma three three, and sigma one one. The point of separation between the elastic regime and the plastic regime is controlled by the von Mises stress equaling to a four hundred. When we substitute the expressions for sigma 2, 2 and sigma 3, 3 in the von Mises st stress equation, we can find the corresponding value of sigma on 1 at the point of separation, which turns out to be 700 MPa. 
It is important to understand that this loading condition combined with the von Mises plasticity predicts a very high increase in the stress um, before yielding initiates. You can see here that sigma 1, 1 reaches 700, sigma 2, 2 and sigma 3, 3 reach 300, while the yield stress is 400. Because the applied stresses are predominantly hydrostatic, uh, and under this material model, the hydrostatic stress do not uh, cause any yielding. Up to the point of separation between the elastic and plastic regimes, elastic strains can be calculated using the elasticity constants. Beyond the elastic regime, the consistent degondition relates the rates of stresses, sigma uh, dot one one, sigma two dot one, uh, two two, sigma dot three three, with the equivalent plastic strain. Rearranging, we can find a relationship between the equivalent plastic strain and the rates of the stresses. Again, we know the rate of sigma uh, dot one one because that's the, the stress that we are applying, that's the stress that we are increasing, but these are controlled by keeping epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 equal to zero. So, the rates of sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 are not given, but the total strains are given as zero. The total strains, the rate of the total strain 2 2 and the total strain 3 3 are equal to the sum of the elastic strain rate and the plastic strain rate. The elastic strain rate is related to the stresses using the elasticity constants. Plastic strain rate is related to the equivalent plastic strain multiplied by the corresponding uh, uh, rate of change of phi with respect to the corresponding stress component. Uh, these two conditions relate the equivalent plastic strain rate with the stress component, with the strain, with the stress rate components, or with the rate of the stress components, and so on. I used and dissolved within Mathematica to integrate the equations numerically, but they can also be integrating using any initial value problem integration technique. The relationship between the different stress and strain components and sigma on one all follow a bilinear behavior. The plastic strains are shown in three of these graphs, kick in at the onset of yielding. The plastic strains are all zero up to sigma on one, one up, up unto the point when sigma on one reaches 700 MPa. The longitudinal plastic strains in the second and third direction are compressive these are negative values, while it's a tensile in the uh, first direction. The elastic strains, on the other hand, are tensile in the second and third direction, since the sum of these strains and the plastic strains are equal to zero. The relationship between the total strain and the applied stress shows a very steep behavior, which, uh, uh, which is a result, result of the predominance of the hydrostatic stress in, the loading, in this loading condition. Even at a stress of 1000 MPa, the equivalent plastic strain is very small. Remember, this value can reach up to 24% right, here, right now at 1000 MPa, it's less than, it's about 0.14%. Um, which is very, very small, implying almost no plastification, even with very high stresses. This last loading condition was chosen intentionally to highlight the behavior of the von Mises plasticity model in loading scenarios predominantly controlled by hydrostatic stress. In such cases, fracture of metal could be a governing and should be added on top of the von Mises plasticity model.